Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our COVID-19 media briefing. I'm Carrie Sheedy, the Public Information Officer for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. With us today, we have Robin Shurik. She's the Director of the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency's Public Health Branch. Dr. Karen Ramstrom is our Health Officer. Matt Pontus is the Shasta County CEO. And we have Mark Mitchelson from Shasta Regional Medical Center. We'll start with the numbers. As of yesterday, we have 9,315 confirmed cases, including 67 from Sunday and 121 from Monday. We've done a total of 116,057 negative tests for a total of 125,000 372 tests. We've got 52 people hospitalized in Shasta County, including six in the intensive care unit. We have um, an estimated 726 active cases and 8,486 people who have been released from isolation to date. Um, as of today, we have had 103 people who have been confirmed to have died from COVID-19 um, Shasta County residents. I think we're going to start today with Robin Shurik. Thank you. Good morning. We have um, a lot of information to share about vaccine today, but quickly before we get to that, I wanted to reiterate some information that I shared at the Board of Supervisors meeting yesterday, as well as provide an update. So what I shared yesterday is that our case rate from the week after Christmas reflects an all-time high of 48.3 daily cases per 100,000 population. And our test positivity is up as well. It is at 9.4%. Uh, with regard to the ICU availability, um, and that is the metric that determines whether we are subject to the regional stay at home order. I mentioned at yesterday's board meeting that there was a large decrease in our capacity from 35% on Monday to 17.6% yesterday, but that there are some issues with the way that the data is being collected and the state is aware of that and they are working on it. The update since then is that the state has not released new data from yesterday like they normally do each morning for the previous day. They have said that they are taking a look at the criteria both for entering the stay at home order and for coming back out of it once you're in it. And we also heard from another county in our region on a call this morning that that drop to 17.6% may have been due at least in part to a data entry error by one of the hospitals in their county. So the state is looking into that as well. And as soon as they release a new figure for our region, we will include that in our daily update, but they may not release anything today. We don't know for sure yet. And that is all I have. All right, thank you, Robin. Dr. Ramstrom is up next. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I wanted to provide an update today on what's going on with vaccinations. Um, so as far as what the county allocations, um, we're working closely with our uh, partners in the community um, for those that are enrolled in the state um, immunization program to be able to receive vaccine to get this into the arms of people in our community and our priority list. Um, phase 1A, just to remind people as healthcare personnel and residents in uh, skilled nursing facilities and long term other long term care um, assisted living facilities. Um, so we're making progress. A big focus this week is to um, we're um, knocking out uh, tier two, at least making progress in that direction um, with our in-home support service providers, as well as community health workers, and primary care clinics. Um, and so we have um, kind of divvied those up across a variety of local partners. And so making progress there. Um, and then we'll, we are planning for um, the tier three groups, hoping to get those going late this week or next week. Um, and so um, that will include like specialty offices, that kind of a thing, um, so that we really get through our healthcare community and making sure that our healthcare uh, professionals and personnel in the community are protected. Um, you may be aware that um, this, the uh, secretary of the um, Federal Health and Human Services Agency um announced um an intention and a goal of moving towards individuals that are 65 and over um so that's been a point of uh much discussion um since that was announced in the media yesterday um at, here in california um and um the california community vaccine advisory committee had an emergency meeting to discuss that last night we just got off a call with the state this morning there have been a couple calls and so um what it's looking like, the advisory committee um, is has some recommendations, but it hasn't been finalized yet. I'll have to go up through the governor's office 
um, what, how that will be implemented in California. And it looks like the recommendation is to um, shift the phase 1B um, age focus to be down to 65 and older. So we're not there yet. We're still in phase 1A, our healthcare personnel. Um, but that is yet to be finalized. Um, a lot of concerns at the county level that were shared with the state today about um, capacity and vaccine supply. So right now our supply is really um, pretty proportionate and, and not even fully meeting our needs for our healthcare personnel um, if every single person wanted it. And so we'll see more to come later today um, and we'll keep um, plugging away. That's our goal here is to keep working um, to meet the current plans that we have in place to reach um, our healthcare personnel in Shasta County and then thinking ahead toward um, phase 1B, um, uh, hoping to get there soon. And that's all I have this morning, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Ramster. Um, Mark, you wanna go next? Sure, uh, so I just kind of bring uh, back to what Robin was saying about the discrepancy in the uh, statistics of the drop in percentage of ICU capacity. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, I, I'm actually kind of glad that the, uh, there's a potential for uh, data entry there for that percentage, because what we've seen is a little bit of an increase in our uh, emissions, but not to that drastic point. Um, it, you know, what we see in most of our ICUs currently are non-COVID patients. Um, because we, you know, we still have the heart surgeries, the uh, heart attacks, um, anything that typically gets an ICU, that's still the majority of cases in our ICUs. So, um, you know, uh, what we've seen as the discrepancy, and I'm sure it's probably just a data entry error, and we'll probably uh, this next week see it go back up to what we have been at the 25 to 35 percent. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, Robert or Dean, did either of you want to start us off with anything this morning? Robert, uh, why don't you continue on with the hospital report? All right. Well, we're, uh, to Mark's point, I think our admissions have been relatively consistent. Uh, again, we haven't seen a huge uptick in, in ICU admissions for COVID per se. Uh, I'll tell you on a personal note, we watch this on a daily basis. It's kind of like watching the stock market and it's probably not a good thing because <laughs> every time I see that little dip, I think, oh, maybe we're gonna get there and then we, we'll see a little increase. So we're hopeful. Uh, we continue to work with all of the healthcare providers in getting them vaccinated. Uh, I can share that we're probably right about a 50% mark with our own staff. And as I shared with the advisory group last week, there are probably two other groups of folks that are waiting for their vaccine. One is the group that really wants to see how do my peers do after they get their second dose? And once they see that there has not been a huge uh, reaction, I think that group will come forward and want to be vaccinated. There's also a group of employees who are Maybe they've had a surgical procedure, they're set scheduled for surgery, or they're currently pregnant, uh, or just concerned about getting this vaccine while, while breastfeeding. So I think once those employees are past that mark, I, I believe many of them will get vaccinated as well. We're hopeful that we can get up in the high 60 percent, or percent ranking. Um, and that, that to me will be a really good mark. I've asked the advisory board, let's not get too carried away on, you know, how many healthcare workers are vaccinated until we actually get through the process. And I think uh, we're working with Shasta Community Health. We want to partner with Shasta Community Health actually on larger scale vaccination efforts. Uh, we're all, everybody on this call is working together on how we're going to do this for the community. And and I I think like most things in Shasta County, we're going to stick together until it's done. All right. Thank you, Robert. Dean, you're up. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, for that, Robert. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's very true uh, about working together. Um, 
this week for us has been getting the vaccine into our employees uh, and uh, we've had some good luck there. We're, we're hoping to, our goal is to crack that 70% level, but it's gonna be a bit of a push and I think it's a process. I agree with Robert. I think it's gonna take some time because some people are sitting on the fence. Some people have reasonable health questions and so on and so forth, but we'll hopefully um, you, know, you know exceed that mark and that's our goal. Um, I, our other focus right now is trying to help in terms of uh, assisting um, other medical practices, the smaller doctor's offices, the optometrists, and those, those folks who uh, are looking for a way to immunize, uh, particularly their staff. Um, I've had a couple of outreaches from um, specialist physicians who got their immunization at the hospital, but then I uh, had one say to me, he comes to the office and, and his staff are all working with patients and, and they're all looking at him saying, okay, uh, what about us? So um, working with public health and, uh, and our colleagues, uh, we, we've been uh, starting Monday, we've been starting to facilitate that. Uh, public health is, is kind of the, the, the scheduling master on this one. And then I think Friday, we're, we're going to do a big push with, with uh, our volunteers or staff from the hospitals and perhaps others to really make a dent in the uh, healthcare workforce in our community, at least get a good start there. So that's what we've been up to. Um, so far, we've seen an increase, I think, from the holidays. It's starting to show in terms of people with symptoms. And, um, you know, uh, knock on wood, uh, we're hoping uh, not a lot of that ends up at the hospital. But um, I think it was you, Dr. Ranstrom, yesterday at the Board of Supervisors said that uh, across the state, about 12% of those who are positive end up in the hospital. And our rate is about half that much here. Um, so for whatever reason, um, you know, let's, uh, I think that's a, that's a good sign. And, and hopefully the best sign would be people not getting the virus. So um, happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Dean. Uh, anything else before we go to media questions? Okay, we are ready for you. Well, I've got a question for Dr. Ramstrom. Um, could you talk a little bit about the mass uh, vaccinations that are planned, I think, for this weekend? And also, how do you go about making sure you're only vaccinating the people that are supposed to be there and that other people don't just show up to get a vaccine? Sure, thanks, um, Mike, I forgot to mention that. So yeah, we have our first um, drive up mass vaccination clinic that is uh, focused on um, in-home um, support service providers and community health workers. It's on this Saturday um, at Benton Field. And um, some details were, were um, put out and I um, would defer to on those to make sure we get it right. She can read that in just a moment. Um, so that's the groups that we're focusing on. There may be other miscellaneous groups that we are inviting um, individually. Um, so it is a, a, a drive up clinic that is for in, invited individuals, um, including those that we put out in the media, the in-home service providers and community health workers. Um, and we will be asking for um, ID and some sort of um, uh, credentials that um, helps assure us of what their occupation is. So. Um, and that's about it. So um, it's our it's our first drive up clinic, and we're hoping to learn a lot and be able to scale those up, um, and have uh, both drive up and um, other indoor um, mass vaccination clinics in coordination with all the partners on this call. So we we have several people who are working on that planning right now. Um, so as our as our as our um, vaccine supply increases, we can get that out into the community. Thank you. And then I have one little sort of follow up to Dean's. Uh, he, he mentioned that maybe only 6% of the people end up in the hospital. But yesterday, I believe it was uh, related by Robin, that 96% um, of the people hospitalized have one extra comorbidity. Does that sound right? That's correct. 96% of people who are hospitalized for COVID also have another underlying condition that probably contributes to the severity of their illness from COVID. So we can say almost all the people hospitalized are there for more than one week. Well, they're there for it to be cared for for their illness. They're not there for their other conditions, but they also have those conditions, which, like I said, can sometimes, you know, exacerbate their illness from COVID. Right. And 
We have to remember too that the conditions that the people have that um, are hospitalized are very common conditions in our community. And so we're pulling that information together to make that clear. Um, so these are just, you know, high blood pressure or um, um, COPD or obesity. I mean, so there's, they're very common um, conditions that people have. And so it could be any of us really that end up in the hospital. And we do know of of young people that are hospitalized too, that you would think that, you know, would be able to recover. Um, so we, we, we're gonna work on that messaging because I don't want to dismiss it. And for people to think, oh, I'm healthy, I don't have anything. Um, because most of us actually have something. <laughs> and um, and so we're, we're gonna be working on that. So it's really clear that really anybody can be hospitalized for this, for this illness and it's unpredictable. But we do know that people who have more um, underlying health conditions do have a harder time and stay in the hospital longer, might end up in ICU, have a harder time um, actually fighting the infection. Thank you. To add on to the question you asked, Mike, about the max va mass vaccination clinic, if you go to ShastaReady.org and click on vaccinations, there are some instructions on the top, including the forms that you should bring with you if you are part one of those groups that's been invited to that clinic. Um, we, we encourage you just to stop by that page first and get all the, the details for the whens and the wheres and what she, you should bring with you. Other media questions? Good morning, everyone. This is Anna here from uh, Channel 12. Um, I kind of wanted to ask a little bit more about the ICU drop. Robin, you mentioned it was um, a, possibly a data entry error um, coming from another county. Do you know what county that it's coming from? Um, I believe it was Mendocino County. We had a call this morning with all of the counties from our region, and they mentioned that uh, one of their hospitals the, what the what they had entered made it look like they had added surge beds and had patients in those beds and that didn't in fact happen. So they believed that it was a data entry error. I don't know which hospital it is. And so when did the, you know, the Northern California region find out about this discrepancy? Because we, like you mentioned, we had a, pre, we were well above the 15% mark last week and then we all of a sudden dropped to 17. Yeah, so we were just given the 17 number yesterday and we sort of questioned like, oh, that seems weird that it would drop so much in one day because as I mentioned on Monday, it was 35%, um, but we didn't find out about this data entry error until this morning. And then on that same call, the state mentioned that they're looking into some issues with the data and so they are not releasing new data for today or they haven't so far anyway. But is it a possibility, like, like say it wasn't um, <clears throat> a data entry error, and we are in that 17%, how close could the county be to reaching that 15% regional stay-at-home order? So just based on what we've heard from our um, partners in other counties in our region, as well as what, what the folks from our hospitals here in Shasta County have said, we don't believe that that 17% is accurate. Um, and if it is, you know, it could be some sort of just random fluctuation and it may go back up in the following day. You know, if there was a true drop from 35% to 17% in one day, then it could increase again the following day, but we don't believe that it's accurate. So will the state be releasing at least a newer regional capa ICU capacity um, tomorrow? Because you said they're not doing it today. They have not told us what their plans are beyond that they didn't release a new number this morning and they're looking into it. Thank you, Robin. And then um, this one's for the hospitals. Um, I know Mark and Robert, you touched upon a little bit. I wanted to just follow up and ask like, um, right now, what is your ICU capacity looking like? I know Mark, you mentioned that most of your, it looks like most of your ICU is non-COVID patients at this time. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think our COVID in the ICU, uh, number in the ICU is pretty minimal and we've got uh, a good ability to flex up uh, if we do get a surge, but right now it's all non-COVID uh, type patients. And I think we're very similar, Anna. I believe I believe today we today and yesterday I think we had every bed uh, occupied, but realized that every day is kind of a new day, and patients move to different levels of care. Thank you. If I have any follow-ups, I'll just pop in again. 
Hey there, uh, Matt Brannon at the Record Search Light newspaper in Reading. And I had a similar sort of question about our ICU capacity. Um, Robin, do you know what percent of our COVID patients, uh, what percent of our current ICU patients are COVID patients in our county or in our region or both, if we know that? I can look it up really quick. I don't have it in front of me, but I will go and find it. Let me just. Okay. No, no worries. I can ask a different question then while, while that's happening um, for Dr. Ramstrom. I wondered, you know, I've heard about other counties that have extra vaccine over that they can't get rid of it fast enough because some people are declining to take it. Do we have uh, something like that going on where we have more than we expected because people are declining and are we trying to sort of uh, get rid of it quickly? So um, we haven't seen an issue with not being able to get it out because of interest. We actually have a lot of people calling and a lot of inquiries about when do, when can I get my vaccine. Um, there have been several you know, we have to realize that we're using a system that's not part of our normal uh, way of getting medications out to people, um, including vaccines. And so we're kind of putting up, a, we're, we're doing kind of some workarounds to get these systems in place, all the way from um, identifying which groups and reaching out to them and scheduling them. You know, they're, they're, they're processes that we don't normally do. And so it's all of those pieces, getting providers enrolled. We can only provide vaccine to enrolled providers, which currently is limited to our um, hospitals and our, and our um, clinics, our federally qualified health clinics. And so that limits our capacity of who can actually, who we can out, give vaccine to and who can vaccinate. I mean, so all of that's in the works to increase that capacity so we can start getting this through our normal health delivery system, hopefully um, not, to, and not, not too far down the road, um, but it takes time to make all of that happen. There's procedures to get all of that done. And so that's what we've seen more so than um, interest. We, we think there's interest there um, and it's all in the works right now. And we have multiple different ways that we're getting vaccine in people's arms right now. And, um, and we're using all of those. So in, uh, one addition this week was is Safeway. So as of today, Safeway started vaccinating groups that we're sending to them. Um, and so that's great. Um, our smaller primary care clinics in particular, we want to be going to Safeway. Um, we're adding the mass vax clinics. We're hoping to have more than one of those a week. Um, Shasta Community Health Center is, have, is scheduling appointments every day for vaccine clinics for groups that we're scheduling with them. Mercy Medical Center has been doing that. Shasta Community Health Center has volunteered to augment um, Shasta Community Health Center's clinics, as is Mercy. And so all of this is in the works. And um, Hill Country is doing vaccinations for us. Shingletown, Mercy, our Mayor's Memorial is doing um, quite a lot in their area. Mountain Valley's just got vaccine a couple days ago. So it's all in the works. Um, it just takes time. It's a lot of vaccines to give um, and coordination. It's not, it's not the interest. We think the interest is there. Good. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And then do you know what the number is of how many doses have arrived in our county and also how many have been put in arms so far? So the first, um, so it's it's an evolved answer. I can tell you the allocations to the county. So we have um, 7,000 doses um, um, that we, and then we just gave 1,200 to Safeway. And so we're down to about 5,800, but that doesn't count the doses that go directly to Mercy Medical Center. Um, and so we're trying to get a handle on that. The other thing to keep in mind too, is that the VA receives vaccine directly from the federal government and the veterans clinic, the VA home, um, that's a separate um, um, situation, but the veterans clinic gets it from the feds as do um, Pitt River and Reading Ranch VA are getting it from Indian Health Service. So um, we're looking forward to be able to get that information out of the California Immunization Registry. Um, and so we're looking into that so that we can see countywide the number of doses that have been received and administered um, to people. Okay, and that 7,000 number you said that does or does not, just to clarify, include the uh, uh, tribes and uh, VA? It doesn't, it's a separate, that's actually allocated to public health to give out to our health, to um, our uh, vaccinators, which are our providers in the community. Gotcha. Okay. And then I know in the past you've spoken about the f uh, partnership program with pharmacies coming in to vaccinate our nursing homes. Do we know about what percentage of residents or staff were through? Do we know if we're like 5% done with that? Or 
50 or where we would be around? I can't give you a percentage, but I can tell you um, I added up what we got a couple days ago, um, which was about 500 individuals vaccinated, but that didn't include some clinics that happened a day or two before that. Um, so it's more than 500. Um, and I believe all but two of our facilities um, have started, one starts tomorrow. So um, after tomorrow, we'll only have one facility that hasn't initiated vaccination yet, and that starts next week. So um, they're making pretty good progress. And keeping in mind too that, um, so they're vaccinating both staff and the residents. So those numbers include both. Gotcha, thank you. And then you also mentioned the uh, possible plan, it hasn't been finalized, but that they might shift prioritization in 1B to people 65 and old. Do we, if that change happens, um, is that something that would be happening in the next few days or weeks, or do we have an idea of what the, what will happen there? Yeah, so that was a national um, change. And so the state of California is determining how to implement that here based in our populations and where we are and getting this out to our healthcare personnel in phase 1A. Um, and so I believe there will be an announcement from the governor's office today about that. Um, but, but the intention um, from the California Community Vaccine Advisory Committee that looked at that national recommendation, they met last night. Their intention is to keep phase 1A as it is. That's currently, it continues to be the first priority. Um, and then phase 1B, what they did is they lowered the age from 75 to 65. Um, but that adds a lot of people and more people than we have vaccine for. So that's the that's the decision that needs to be made. And every community is going to have to approach that based on their supplies and their own population demographic. And so we're going to keep plugging away at phase one, one A um, and we'll um, meet with our task force like we do every Friday and make decisions moving forward based on what we what we learn from the state um, later today or tomorrow. Okay, great, thank you. I think that's everything I wanted to know, unless, uh, uh, Robin, did you get a chance to see what the COVID numbers were? Yeah, so as of yesterday in our region, the percentage of ICU patients who are COVID patients is 22.4%, and in Shasta County, it's 15%. Gotcha, okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Actually, I did have something I wanna follow up. It's Anna here. Um, if we were to shift to that, this one's for Robin, to shift into that regional stay-at-home order, how long would we expect to be in that category? Is it like similar to being in the blueprint for safer economy tiers? So yeah, the, the way that it works right now is that once you enter the stay-at-home order, you have to stay in it for, I believe it's three weeks, and then your data has to show that not only at that point in time, but the projections going forward look like you're going to be doing better before you can come out of it. But as I mentioned earlier, the state is re-looking at what that criteria is going to be going forward, so it could change. They just haven't released anything new yet. Thank you. And then the ICU drop, does that also, is that just COVID patients or is that including non-COVID patients? No, it's looking at ICU capacity overall. So it's out of all of the ICU beds that exist, how many of them are available to receive a patient, whether the, that patient is needing that bed for COVID care or care for some other condition or injury. Perfect. And then I have one more thing. Um, you know, it's been a couple of weeks now since the holidays. Have we seen that holiday surge that, you know, public health and other, um, you know, hospital leaders were expecting? Have, have we seen that yet? Definitely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our case rate for that week after Christmas, so that's December 27th to January 2nd, is the highest it's ever been. So that is a new all-time high in, in our case rate at 48.6%. Um, and that is definitely a result of Christmas, you know, gatherings and travel and those kinds of things. And I anticipate that the when the next week's data comes out, it will be high as well because it will show cases that came from gatherings over New Year's. Anna, did you have anything else? No, sorry, I think that kind of covers it for me. <laughs> sorry. And just to reiterate what Robin is saying, um, we would we would certainly encourage you to um, 
to allow us to confirm that that has in fact been a drop in the ICU before you know, we, we share that as news because it may not be correct. It, we'll know soon, but right now we cannot confirm that there has actually been a drop to that 17% level in the ICU because it might've been a mistake. Um, any other media questions? Oh, sorry, Dean, go ahead. No, I, I, I didn't want to lose one point that Dr. Anstrom, you made again yesterday, the Board of Supervisors, and, you know, we're very focused on hospitalization, ICU capacity, rightly so right now. Um, but you pointed out, and it's something that is near and dear to us in the primary care space, that there is evidence of long-term implications of getting the virus as far as uh, complicating already existing chronic diseases, uh, the onset of new issues. Um, and I wondered if you wouldn't mind saying something about that. Yes, thank you, Dean. So. Um, you're absolutely right. And there's more and more studies coming out across different populations. Some of these are um, population-based surveys. Some of them are in particular clinics that primary care, and they just, they report on all of their patients that have had COVID and any long-term um, ongoing symptoms. And so um, across these studies, it's been varying percentages, but pr really pretty high at six months. Um, there's a variety of symptoms. Um, and so I think we're in a place where we need to kind of have all of those studies pulled together to see exactly what that looks like. But um, many of these studies um, are like in the 70 percentages of even people who have not been hospitalized or had fairly mild illness um, or minimal symptoms can, can, can have um, symptoms at the six month mark. And so um, people who've had like myocarditis, they have ongoing fatigue, problems with exertion, um, they can have some neurologic symptoms like um, some uh, just brain, just fuzziness and uh, cognitive um, not being quite as sharp. Um, so not being able to get back to work as quickly um, or, you know, full time, um, even at that six month mark. Um, even among people who don't have underlying, who are normally healthy, um, we've seen that. So there's a lot to learn about this illness. And so that's why we encourage people to continue to, to take care and prevent um, exposure to the best of their ability until they can get vaccinated. And so um, thank you for the reminder, Dean. It's really, it's really something that is of concern to the medical community and I think to our society at large, because if a large proportion of people are getting this illness and then have ongoing symptoms and aren't able to function and go to work, that's problematic for our communities. And so not to mention those families. Um, um, so it's, it's a reminder that we really need to do our best to prevent and not assume that this is a mild illness. Please do not assume that this is just like a cold. It is not. Um, we're lucky some people recover and don't have those ongoing symptoms, but um, a good number um, continue to have um, problems at that six month mark and, and beyond. Um, so that's just the research that we know so far. Thank you, Dr. Ramstrom. Um, other media questions? Hello, it's Alexandria Williams at KRCR. Uh, thank you for letting me join a little late here to the meeting, but I appreciate you guys being here. Um, we were interested in doing a, uh, a story today about how the in-home supportive services caregivers are now able to do the clinics and get their COVID vaccine at our local Safeways. So I was wondering if someone could elaborate on the screening process for that. So what I would say is, so um, our, our drive-up clinic on Saturday and the access to vaccination at Safeway, all of these are by invitation because we're trying to get the individuals that are high risk in phase 1A vaccinated. And so we've outreached to them in particular and invited them um, to come and get vaccinated in those two locations. And so Safeway would be, way we'd be asking for um, identification and they have a registration process and they know the groups that we've sent to them. So that's how that works is that it's in, you know, it includes um, a primary care um, providers too and their staff have been referred to Safeway as well. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to clarify because I spoke to someone, uh, a representative for Safeway earlier this morning and they redirected me to the uh, code 22, I believe that was sent out by public health where they can apply online for an appointment. Does that apply to this as well? So the process, the process is, is that we work with Safeway and we say, 
X group we're vaccinating right now. So IHSS workers, for example, and, and then Safeway sends us um, access to appointments that we share with that group. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else we need to know about that screening process for these uh, in-home uh, caregivers? So um, basically they would need to go um, to come to our drive up clinic on Saturday, um, as Carrie just described, or they are welcome to um, try and get an appointment at Safeway um, with the links that we have shared um, with that group. Great, thank you. People who are part of those groups can go to ShastaReady.org and click on vaccinations and the, the outline of who can participate and what they need to bring to show that they belong to one of those groups, as well as the instructions for making appointments are all, um, are all there on that web page. Great, thank you, Gary. Yeah, of course. Any other media questions? Oh, Matt, I saw your light come on a minute ago. Yeah, um, thanks. I just wanted to, it's my only other question is just looking ahead, we've had these surges in the past where we have high case rates followed by a little lag, then hospitalizations, and then the lag, and then deaths. Uh, could Dr. Ramstam or Robin just sort of talk about what we, you know, expect might happen over the next few weeks with these uh, highest case numbers we've had so far? Yeah, so as you mentioned, historically, whenever we have a surge in cases, that's followed within a couple of weeks after that with an increase in hospitalizations. And then naturally, you know, a certain percentage of those end up passing away. Um, and so we expect to see the same thing anytime that our cases increase. So with this surge after the holidays, you know, happening the end of December, early January, we expect to see later in January an increase in hospitalizations, followed by probably February or so. Um, arise in our deaths. We also have quite a few deaths that happened in December and January that are still pending. We're still waiting for confirmation that they were in fact COVID deaths before we report them, but there are quite a few in line for that. Gotcha, thank you. Any other media questions? Sonny, I see your green light and I don't hear your voice. Mm, do you, we'll give you a second if you wanna put the, your question in the chat box. Jail, okay, okay. she's asking um, about cases in the jail, I'm guessing. Um, wanting to know if there are cases in the jail. Um, so we have had um, cases in deputies and um, a handful of inmates over the course of this outbreak, um, as well as all of our other congregate settings. We're typically working with 20 or so congregate settings. Um, most of them typically have a handful of residents or staff at a time, and sometimes um, we'll have two or three facilities that their numbers go up and we have to work with them more closely. And so um, at the jail, they've had, just like other, other work spaces, have had um, some staff um, and so, um, but not a large number. And so um, we just go through our regular process in terms of case investigation, identifying close contacts, and then um, determining quarantine based on the capacity of that employer. Um, so nothing, there's nothing of concern, but just like many of our other um, places of employment and congregate settings, we um, routinely have a handful of cases of staff and um, residents in those congregate settings. Thank you. And then her other question is also, is it possible for someone to sacrifice their vaccine to someone else, almost like donating vacation time at I That's think it. somebody it's has an to interesting that. question. Yeah, go ahead, Gary. I'm imagining that people still have to fit into that criteria that we're vaccinating right now, right? They would still need to show that they're part of that group. Right. Okay. And then her other question is, so Shasta County has a lower percentage of those with COVID who end up hospitalized, but they stay longer. Do we have any idea why that might be? 
So our best guess, we don't know for sure, but our best guess is that the reason that we have fewer people who end up in the hospital in the first place is because many of our cases have been in younger people who, you know, in theory are less likely to acquire severe illness and end up needing hospitalization. And then the flip side of that would be of those who do end up in the hospital, you know, they are likely to have underlying conditions. And um, there's also a factor that could come into play where if people have sort of unmanaged underlying conditions, you know, then that could make it even harder to care for them. I don't know if maybe the hospitals have anything they want to add to the patients they've been seeing, but that's sort of our theory from the public health standpoint. Not, not so much that, and I'm, I'm not a physician, so I'm not speaking from, from that standpoint, but the other dynamic that we have here in the North State, besides having many people with multiple comorbidities, is we don't have all of the post-acute resources that we used to have. So, you know, the, the campfire, we lost some of our post-acute resources. And then as we've gone through this pandemic, some of our normal resources that are available to us aren't because, you know, they're, they're unable to admit. So I don't know if I, I would think that that contributes to some of the difference as well. I know many of our partner hospitals elsewhere seem to have other resources available to them that we don't have here in the North State. Yeah, you know, another thing I would say is that I know it's also um, not necessarily us being <clears throat> longer, but um, um, so I know some other parts of the state, the hospitalization, the comparison and, and the percentage of hospitalizations, other parts of the state, they're actually managing more patients in the outpatient setting because their hospitals have been so overwhelmed. So that uh, it has to be factored in as well um, in terms of how we compare to um, other regions of the state. Any other questions? Okay, hearing then, we will um, adjourn for the day and we will see you all again next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Um, everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you for being here today.